Place effect markers on your table to instantly increase immersion. Use them for spells, special boss actions or just as environmental effects. Hello, today on Bardscraft, a follow-up to the episode Incredible Incantations. Epic Evocations. Don't worry, I still have lots of cheesy titles left. Let's craft some spell markers now. Let's begin with the ice wall. First, I'm gonna make something like that. This is a quick test piece that can surely be improved upon. To make this, I cut out squares from a sheet of cardstock. In order to get consistent bits, I cut a few straight strips of different thickness. Three, two and a half and two centimeters wide. From these, I then cut out some of the bits that are needed. Here it is important to make clean cuts with a sharp blade and to use a hard cardstock to get sharp edges. I just know some packages are made from a less dense paper material. As I somehow try to demonstrate, you can see that this cardstock is clearly not as good. To glue the bits together, hot glue is the quick approach. With a dab of hot glue, the smaller squares were easily attached on both sides of the one larger square. There can be some gaps in between here, so make sure to paint well. I went ahead and made the rest. A total of 8 should do. 6 for the wall of ice, 2 for something else. I have a few ideas in mind. Now if you're like me and you didn't get more than half of the pieces straight, you can make quick adjustments by cutting away some. Also remember to remove any visible hot glue. The hot glue will become extra visible if you leave it on for painting. Good, all of them are now cleaned up. Next, I cut out tiny cardstock bits that will be some sort of magical symbols appearing on the segments of the ice wall. These can be anything you imagine, as long as they aren't too complicated to be cut out from cardstock. I attach these with PVA glue to save me from the inevitable hot glue mess. Here I didn't glue one on each side. A suitable 9 symbols is enough for me. To make more textures on the cardstock, I made cuts into it. A very sharp blade ensures clean and sharp textures. These deep grooves will look amazing when dry brushed and highlighted. I cut many of the grooves deep enough to go through one or even two layers of cardstock. Then I also made some indentations for additional details. Now it seems like it's time to paint. I mixed these two colors into a dark blue paint and started base coating. For this, I do recommend using miniature paints instead of cheaper craft paint. For the cleanest results, it's best to get a full cover with a thin layer of paint, and that's easy to do with these paints. As I mixed more paint along the way, these vary a bit in color. We'll see which one works best. I then dry brushed all of these with blue. Did this quite heavily with plenty of paint on the brush. I was a bit messy sometimes, but these do look good with a less uniform paint job. This one had a lighter base coat. As you can see, the other ones base coated with a darker blue look better. Next up is a greenish blue. Here I took my time when dry brushing. A messy layer is okay when hidden under many other layers. This one won't be as hidden as the blue one. I made sure to apply some paint on the flat surfaces as well. And as you can see, these look quite good compared to the unpainted ones. 
I have found these army painter bottles to be good for many of the smaller bits in my projects, otherwise cheap craft paints are good for terrain. If you're just starting out or need crafting supplies, you can get recommended products through the links in the descriptions. Thanks, here we can already see some of the nice textures. I am moderately impressed. Now it is time for a white dry brush. It is important that the brush is really dry here. When I didn't know any better, I sometimes got frustrated at inconsistent painting results. As it turns out, the problem was usually a too wet brush. When painting, I focused mostly on the edges, just a light brushing. Here we can really start to see the power of the sharp edges. This reminds me of Games Workshop's minis, for example, that have sharp edges and deep cuts makes painting a joy. Try to create those properties on your crafts as well. Since we all have time, here are some examples of crafts with deep textures. And also the only decent miniature I've painted, still a peasant level paint job though, easily done with all of those sharp textures. Hey, if you like what you see and appreciate the content, subscribe, like and let me know what you think in the comments, that surely helps. These are almost done. I figured a white highlight on the edges would go well here. I only painted some parts of the edges. That worked well, here is an unhighlighted one for comparison. I also made sure to highlight the deeper cuts I had made. Here I was thinking, not sure if this looks like magical ice, but it does look good anyway. And another unclear thing, how will these be based so that they can be built into an ice wall, in many different configurations? Okay, all done. Looking at these now, I can see that the one with the darkest base coat looks best, noted. Now how will these stand? To quickly base this, I traced out round cardstock bits. They are a bit smaller than the squares. On these, I applied a thick snow paste and placed on the ice square. I have shown the use of this paste in a few videos already. Simply mix PVA glue, baking soda and a bit of white paint. I made the snow paste extra thick this time by adding more baking soda. Now it supports the ice a bit even before it's dry. I then applied textures on the snow with a brush. Now you can see them a bit better when I move the light. A quick and simple snow basing method indeed. There will be some visible cardstock though, but I'll paint over it with white. Now I realized that there should be 10 segments, but that's no problem. I got 7 which should do well enough. These two remaining bits can be used as anything, perhaps mysterious dungeon tiles. I'll still work on these a bit later, but now it is time to make something to grab your attention. Grab your foes with these claws. To make these, I started by cutting out bases from a thicker, paper-like material. I'm planning to make three different minis, suitable for spells such as these. The claws or hands are made from barbecue sticks and toothpicks. I made a claw first. I applied hot glue textures on a short bit to begin with. Then I glued it onto a base. That hot glue blob there is okay, I'll cover it with earth textures later. Next, I made the fingers by snapping a toothpick like this. Then I added textures on all of them. Let the glue cool a bit so it's easier to shape. You can also draw some tendons for an undead claw like this. I glued these claws on in some strange arrangement. While at it, I also made the lower piece a bit thicker. You can make some pretty cool textures by moving around the cooling glue. We'll see them better after applying washes. Then, as with the claws and bones from the Dragon's Gorge, I also glued on a strip of cardstock around some of the joints. Okay, here is the other skeletal claw. I was able to make pretty good details with the hot glue. I applied it between fingers and shaped it while blowing at it to make it cool down a bit quicker. The third one will be the earthen grasp. So I didn't use any sharper bits at all here, just glued on barbecue sticks and applied plenty of hot glue to add volume to the hand. 
The hot glue was too hot for this, so I cut the power for a while. That helped. Here I also made sure to add occasional blobs, so it's not too even. Good, the tricky sticky step is done. Now if we're lucky, a miniature of shorter stature should fit under. Let's say a dwarf, yeah. That represents the unfortunate condition of being grappled and restrained quite well. Yes, now it is time to paint. I covered the skeletal claws with a tan, and then base coated the larger one with black. On the claws I applied plenty of strong tone wash. That's quite good for just sticks and glue. Once the wash had dried, I dry brushed some parts with white, just a bit on the highest details. For fun, I added some colors as well. I brushed on some blue and orange to the larger one. Purple and pink for the smaller one. A bit strange, but I'll still come back with more washes later. To cover the bases and the earth hand, I mixed a texture paint from baking soda and brown. Yeah, that looks pretty decent. I started by covering the bases. This was quite easy. The earthen grasp, on the other hand, proved to be a bit more tricky. It's not so easy to get a full coverage with a thick paste. Luckily, the hand is paced with black, so a few uncovered spots don't matter. After a while, I dry brushed the earth textured areas with a light brown. I did that on all of these. After that, I dry brushed with a tan. I also painted some areas of this one with green. The sorry excuse of a battery ran out, so here it is after I was done. Looking almost good enough, all this needs now is some flocking. I applied PVA glue on some areas of the base and also on the hand itself. Then I sprinkled on green flocking. I used dill for this. I did the same for the other minis as well. Looks much better now. Keep in mind you can use herbs such as dill for flocking, as long as you don't take this too seriously. For additional foliage I glued on these dried grass tufts. They are just bits of hemp rope. This method is a bit tricky, but it worked well because I only needed a few small tufts. More about peasant level tufts in this video. Once the glue was dry, I worked a bit with the strong tone wash again, darkening a few places. I like how these turned out, these will have many uses even as monster miniatures. I still had a few things in mind, fire, earth and something otherworldly. I wanted to use foam, so I chose to make the earthen pillars next. The bones of the earth. I cut out six many-sided pillars of XPS foam. First I cut these rough bits, thick enough for the width of the pillars. Once I had these bits ready, I cut off from the sides to create a nicely shaped pillar. A tip for cutting, use drawing cuts on the foam. That's all of my six pillars. I made them of varying height, as you can see. Now they need textures. I applied stone textures by pressing a ball of aluminum foil into the foam. Fun fact, I've used this one for almost two years now. Now that the pillars are shaped, I cut in some cracks and tore off some bits of foam. Then I worked the cracks with a pen, making them deeper. Actually, making the cracks with the pen worked even better. I liked that and made more textures in this way. There we go, these pillars are now ready to be painted. I applied a black base coat first. A cheap craft paint is good enough for this. After a while, I overbrushed with a dark brown. A lighter brown would surely be better, but this is what I got. Next I dry brushed the pillars with grey. That was too much paint on the brush at first. It is better to brush for a longer time with little paint, than to quickly brush with plenty of paint on the brush.
The motion of the brush is also a big deal. Do this instead of this. The motion makes sure that your paint gets on the highlights and stays out of the deeper groove that we want to keep dark. Another quick tip here is to focus a bit more on the edges. In this way the shape of the pillar becomes sharper, which looks quite good. Those are some nice pillars. I like the many cracks. They make them look breakable, as the spell suggests 30 hit points. Now a gentle dry brush with a near white paint should be the last step for these foam pillars. With this color I also mainly focused on the edges. I thought about basing these in a similar way as with the claws, but then I also wanted these to fit anywhere on the battlefield, so anywhere on the terrain I used. These will be no display pieces, so they need to be based on something small and heavy. Yes, finally I can get some use for these Swedish coins. I simply hot glued these under the pillars. Easy and effective. I then quickly removed any hot glue mess I found. I also discovered that there is a 25% risk of separation between coin and pillar when these are dropped on the floor. Luckily this should not happen in a real life situation, right? To easily finish the bases I painted them with a matte black, trying not to hit the pillars. I also covered the bottom, just in case I wanna use these as fallen pillars in halls of stone. As a bonus, these pillars can also be used as terrain, and most obviously they can be used as, you know, as pillars, or as part of some epic scenery. Up next, I made something I call the Eldritch Spellgate. This one is very simple to do. Using hot glue, I assembled some sticks into a gate shape on the base. Then, once the gate was in place, I applied glue over the sticks for extra durability, shape and textures. Yeah, that is quite good now. I then glued a few shorter sticks around the base. These should not block vision through the gate. The sticks are just there to decorate the base. See these blobs here, on the test piece. They will be painted as mushrooms. This is how they are made, you just apply hot glue on a pointy end and then let it cool as it forms a droplet shape. At first the glue was too hot and almost dripped off, so I did my best to control the glue. I noticed it is best to wait for a while after applying the glue. Then you just flip the piece. Blowing will also speed up the cooling process. I continued by making these mushroom blobs wherever I could fit them. With some maneuvering of the glue, I was able to create interesting shapes. Whatever you do, remember this is not for anyone that suffers from a weak patience. Good, that's even better than the test piece. I also covered the base with these strange mushroom shapes. As you can see, the use of a stick certainly helped. The footage here is greatly sped up, so you can see this requires some time. Try using a lower setting on the glue gun. On the last few blobs I applied a much cooler glue. This was easier to shape as it started to harden almost instantly. This one is pretty much ready for base painting. I just cleaned up some hot glue strings, and look, here in the middle, I accidentally made a very good looking shape. Moving on, I base coated everything except the base with an almost white paint. If I'm not mistaken, I believe this could be almost enjoyable to paint with an airbrush, not so much with a regular brush. It would be easy to paint gradients of colors over the entire piece. That is done. As with the test piece, I applied the baking soda paint texture on the base. It was a bit tricky to get it in, since it's quite thick. The brush was not in good shape for this, so I used a stick to get it in better. Compared to the claw bases, I made this texture paint a bit darker. That's good. Next, I also painted the rim black, then dry brushed the ground with grey and tan. 
To paint the mini itself, I mixed a dark red wash from water, red and a bit of black. I started applying the wash to see how it worked. I noticed it was a bit too diluted, so I added more red and just a bit of black paint. This is starting to look otherworldly, which is good. I worked with the wash in several layers. As it dried, I applied more. After a while, it looked like this. Next, I applied strong tone wash on the lower areas. My idea was to make a gradient from dark to bright red. To do this, I dry brushed next with red, focusing mostly on the top parts. Now I saw that this will also work well as an objective marker, perhaps some fiendish sight of power. After dry brushing, I painted the topmost parts fully red. Nice little blobs we got there. On the base, I applied just a bit of green flocking, and of course, one tiny grass tuft. I intend to use this as the mentioned Eldritch Spellgate. All magical attacks and magical projectiles get empowered, dealing more damage at longer ranges. The gate can be an ability of a magic item, or a homebrew spell. Here, Faye painted something more colorful out of the test piece. A spell gate suitable for a pact of the Archfey Warlock, perhaps. I cleaned up the bases of the ice wall bits with white, and also dry brushed the snow with a white that is slightly whiter than the snow. We all know a 6th level spell is rarely used in games, so I'll make sure to use these for other spells and effects, or as interactive magic objects as part of some puzzle. Cool. These pillars are not the coolest, but they will surely be the ones I use the most of them all. Now what's that? Yes, a quick earthquake test is required. Ah yeah, good. That should comply to tabletop safety standards. Here I thought I could share the stats of these animated claws and earthy hands I made. Do tell me if you're interested in seeing more lore or stats in the videos. These can be used as some interesting monsters for sure, and of course as spell markers as well. That's many little crafts to use in your tabletop games. More in the previous one, incredible incantations. If these increased your immersion, make sure to subscribe and like for more. Perhaps watch one of these videos next. If you really find this content valuable, consider supporting the channel. You can do so through Patreon or through a Patreon alternative. 